Hello, and welcome to the World Built Environment Forum webinar series. My name is Ken Creighton. I'm the Director of Thought Leadership and Public Affairs at RICS. And today's webinar, we will be discussing resilient urban design for climate risk mitigation. Welcome to you all. We have an audience today that comes from 34 different countries. It's a real honor to be speaking with you all. I'd like to introduce our panelists. The first panelist is David Baxter, MRICS and CEO of Mitigate Risk Management and the chair of the RICS Southeast chapter in the USA based in Atlanta. Welcome, David. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And we have Rob Belvins, founder and senior meteorologist, METCON, based in Eastern Tennessee. Welcome, Rob. Uh, thank you. Look forward to the uh, seminar. And also Crystal Egger, president, Monarch Weather Consulting, uh, coming to us from San Diego. Welcome, Crystal. Yes. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, looking forward to our discussion or fireside chat, as we like to call it. Great. During the webinar, you'll be seeing slides, and the slides have various documents uh, as part of the presentation. Some of them are hard to read, and we will be uploading them to the website with the recording, so you'll have uh, the ability to see them all in detail. We also welcome your active involvement. Please do submit questions during the discussion. It really helps bring the conversation to life. I can see your questions and uh, we'll ask them during the webinar as appropriate. So if you're new to these webinars, you should see uh, the, the ability to submit questions at any time using the question box on your screen. And I will pick them up as we go through the session. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the, the, the first question, um, and I, I'll start with you, David. How well understood is climate resilience among business leaders? Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the question. And um, I think it, it's, it's understood um, to a certain aspect, but they, there seems to be this um, lack of, um, if you like, not necessarily effort, but certainly on on looking at strategies being putting together, um, placing resilience at really the core of their business strategy is something which business leaders need to look at. Um, you know, putting resilience plans um, in place and in relationship with how the economy works and and society and, and adaptation. Um, I think there's certainly a challenging process, but trying to work with others is, is key to that process um, and locally uh, business leaders try to look at um, you know the government policies as to what they're doing and how they can tie into that but I think it's really down to the businesses that they have to look at for themselves um, in, in going beyond um, the challenges that they face in putting these strategies together um, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but it, it's certainly something which um, I feel quite passionate about. Thanks, David. Crystal, any comment? Oh, I think uh, just to chime in here on the weather and climate side, you know, working in the consulting world over the last few years, uh, we we really understand that the climate risk is one of the biggest challenges facing businesses. And I do think that knowledge is power. And the more weather data you have and predictive models and analytics, the better prepared you can be. Um, we certainly can't predict and forecast everything. Weather is not an exact science, but science continues to improve. We have more satellite data, more ground data, and Rob's going to go into more discussion later on just how how much better we are at predicting what's to come. So again, I think knowledge is key here. And I just wanna to touch briefly on some of the top 
hazards and extreme weather risks. I think this is a good global outline of what we're experiencing and what we can expect. Uh, there are so many different elements to our changing climate. There's the counterintuitive side when you think about the freeze that occurred in Texas, for example, back in February, and how that ties in to what's happening with our climate, which we'll talk more about coming up. But when it comes to the overall warming of the planet, you know, we talk about it as a degree of difference. It may not seem like a lot, but a small degree of warming, that small temperature change is going to correspond to enormous changes in the environment. We're impacting the way the jet stream works. We're seeing more extreme weather events. So flooding, for example, the vast amount of water we have in our oceans is also warming. So when that occurs, you're getting more evaporation, about 7% more water in the atmosphere. That's going to lead to higher precipitation events. There are forecasts that show if we continue to warm, we're going to see 20% more rainfall in our storms than what we're seeing now. 20% more rainfall, that's, that's significant. In some cases, where one in 100 year floods occur, we're now seeing one in 10 year floods. When it comes to hurricanes, we just kicked off our Atlantic hurricane season yesterday. We are forecasting another long and active season. The Caribbean, of course, is our zone with the highest concentration of tropical activity around the globe. So uh, as weather enthusiasts, we are gearing up for a busy season right now. And with our hurricanes, we're seeing higher intensity because of the warming waters, rapid intensification before landfall. That's going to impact communities that are vulnerable, especially because the storms strengthen so quickly just before making landfall and, and there's not a lot of preparation time. We're seeing slower movement, uh, rising sea levels, which we'll discuss, increased incidence of storm surge, and then you've got the extreme with the droughts and the heat. You know, our drier regions are becoming drier and seeing longer periods of uh, extended drought and heat waves. Of course, the wildfires. I'm here in California. I can speak a lot to wildfire season and what happened last year specifically. But we're noticing that, you know, fire suppression policies, timber industry practices, they're it's all impacting what's happening with our landscape. And now with our changing climate, our drier season is longer. We're having less snowpack in places like the Sierra Nevada mountains. The snow's melting sooner. And uh, we're seeing, of course, a lot more Santa Ana wind activity. So this just covers some of our top hazards. But looking forward, climate science is telling us that warming is going to continue. So we'll see a rise in global climate hazards in the future, more so than what we're seeing at the moment. David, I didn't know if you had anything to add there. Yeah, in, in, interesting. Um, you mentioning the, the hazards and the extreme weather that's affecting um, uh, the, the global um, uh, aspects, really. And how does that sort of infect um, the infrastructure and, and buildings in, in particular? Um, I work with insurers. Um, I'm, uh, and I'm an insurance uh, risk engineer on behalf of um, a lot of the, the Lloyd syndicates and, and insurers around the world. And, you know, they're certainly looking at um, these sort of hazards in, in a lot more detail. They're collecting a lot more data. Um, they're, they're relying on predictive models um, and, and how that really does affect the operations of our infrastructure, you know, our roads, um, and particularly, um, you know, buildings under construction. Um, people forget that how vulnerable they can be. Um, heavy civil engineering projects with, um, you know, large embankments, uh, which can, from, you know, additional rainfall, can slip and slide and, you know, potentially lead to a collapse of a major infrastructure. Um, generally, infrastructure is, um, if you like, more robust when it's complete. But it's really the the vulnerability of uh, buildings under construction and, and infrastructure under, under construction, which is, you know, one of the the biggest concerns for insurers. Uh, you mentioned some of those risks also about the sea level rise and wildfires and hurricanes. Um, there's an increase in hailstorms 
um, across the you know different regions, and you know that that's that's been a rise on rise year on year, and you know we've seen huge amounts of damage being caused by hailstones um, from an insurance um, aspect. Coastal erosion is another aspect where land is beginning to disappear. Those those buildings uh, construction um, being being uh, developed uh, near the coast. Um, it's causing problems uh, for them as well. Um, I, I lived in Miami for seven years, and uh, particularly near the Miami Beach area, we know that it's very vulnerable to sea level rise. And you know, there's around 125,000 properties that's at risk. You know, uh, in the billions of dollars at risk, which could be lost within 30 years. So, you know, is our infrastructure and our buildings resilient to this? Um, I, I think um, there has to be a lot more done. Um, Miami are doing things uh, to help protect their infrastructure and their buildings. Is it enough? Um, I don't think it is. I think there's you know, aspects which they, they are doing, which is good. And we can talk a bit more about that uh, a bit later. Um, but I, I just want to mention um, one thing that kind of stems from all this. And, and this goes to um, climate gentrification. Um, which you, you you see a lot of you know and going back to Miami in particular, um, the buildings on on the coast were suffering, you know, from flooding and sea level rise, um, of which um, they're now started developers are now starting to look inland, you know, buildings that are potentially or land that is more sort of six foot seven foot above sea level, uh, which can be more protected. But this is where some of the poorer communities um, and the, the sort of working class population uh, reside. Uh, developers are now looking at this to develop, you know, nice uh, uh, tall structures and, you know, increase prices, which uh, regentrifies that, that uh, location and, and pushes those people out. So there's certainly um, other aspects that, uh, that stem from climate change and, and the migration of people moving to different locations. That's that's great point, David. And we actually have a question from Tim Smith, which is really spot on with the point you're making. And I'll I'll read it out. Tim writes: Do the panel think that there is currently equity in the approach to building resilience in urban areas? For example, do you think there is the same urgency in protecting areas along the uh, Megana River in Bangladesh as there is in the approach to protecting London or New York? If not, how do we achieve this? Do you do you want to speak to that, David? Um, I can I can speak to it as much as I know. Um, and and if we take the the global thought process, uh, of just 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 how people react to to things, um, without knowing Bangladesh, um, you know, this is where gentrification steps in. Um, land will become more expensive inland. Uh, whereas, you know, the coastal areas were much more prominent to look at. People want to look at water. Um, if they're going to be suffering from sea level rise, then, you know, clearly those the, the, the land in that area will become less popular. And, and as I say, mass migration will move inland, where land is then more expensive. Um, off, is enough being done to protect those areas? Um, probably not. Um, again, I can only speak for the areas that I know. And if we look at, say, for instance, um, New York, um, and they have, you know, uh, the protection of the, the city of lower Manhattan, which is uh, at low, low levels, um, sea, re sea level rise could affect lower Manhattan. They're, they're spending over $350 million in, in developing uh, sea level uh, seawalls to protect the, the city. Um, could they do that in Bangladesh? It, it will take a lot of um, community aspect, a lot of funding, um, a lot of thought process um, to to go around that to um, help re protect that um, that area. Um, yeah. But it's it's very costly. Great, thanks, David. Um, can I turn to you, Crystal and I, Rob? I think you'll want to comment as well. Which regions and cities are most vulnerable to extreme weather and rising sea levels? Yeah, I'll kick this off. And 
you know, there are different scenarios to look at when it comes to climate modeling and various time frames and climate scenarios, which Rob's going to talk a bit more about in a moment. But I think a lot of questions uh, weigh heavily on sea, ri sea level rise and coastal surge. So we'll start there. And this particular scenario looks at you know, a high emission scenario by 2050 and a small rise in sea level and how many people would be impacted. Some 800 million people could be impacted here in 570 cities from this particular research. And a lot of the vulnerable cities are, of course, on the east coast of the US, um, major cities in Asia, Bangkok, um, um, Shanghai come to mind. Also, Mumbai, India. We talked about some of these areas with the most vulnerable properties in the world, um, extremely expensive um, cities, Manhattan, Miami, for example. This is going to have a huge impact on you know, energy, transport, infrastructure as things continue to change in the coming years. Another vulnerable area, of course, are small island nations looking around Japan. We're going to speak more to this in a moment. But I was actually on the air at the Weather Channel when Hurricane Sandy came ashore and struck New York. That was in 2012. And I'll never forget speaking you know, live to business leaders and, um, of course, city leaders and what they were doing to prepare. And it was really a time of crisis. It, it was something that you know was was unexpected and extremely out of the ordinary for that region. So those coastal floods from Hurricane Sandy ended up impacting some 90,000 buildings, and that was all you know the surge and sea level rise experienced by such a strong, powerful storm. Extensive damage over 19 billion dollars to uh, the area there. Of course, it shut down transportation and commercial activity was significantly impacted. So there's a lot of concern in places like Manhattan um, for future storms, low-lying delta cities where you know typhoon and hurricane zones are are dominant. That's going to be a concern going forward. And as far as mitigating, you know, we'll get into some of that straight ahead. But I think the next slide shows some analysis from Swiss Re. And this just helps us look at an index of the most vulnerable cities, which again will be provided on the website. It, it can be a valuable tool globally um, looking at where the risks are. We know it's it's socioeconomic. It has a lot to do with the geography and and the built environment. There are so many factors involved, but I think this is a great um, index when it breaks down climate economics per city. And Rob, I know you've worked, you know, for decades with global weather and and climate work. You can see Indonesia there, one of the most vulnerable cities in the world, uh, one of the most vulnerable places rather in the in the world when it comes to changing weather and extreme weather events. I don't know if you want to chime in here. Yeah, I mean, the discussion about sea level rise is, is one thing, but then what you also have to do on, on top of that is layer in the fact that, that you want to have stronger and more frequent storms, uh, either hurricanes, cyclones, or typhoons, and, you know, strong mid-latitude storms that could hit into Western Europe as well. So it's not just that the sea level's rising, it's that the storms are going to cause the waves on the top of that sea level to be even higher. So the combination of two impacts really makes a lot of coastal cities extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Rob. Rob, next question to you, carrying on from that. How advanced are predictive climate models? Are we yet able to accurately warn cities and businesses of impending crises? You know, wh weather goes in all kinds of scales. We go from the next hour scale to the next week to the next month. And, and the precision and confidence that we have, the skill that we have, tends to, to change with, with our time scale. Uh, for the next hours and weeks, we use different techniques and models to, to forecast. For the next one to two weeks, we use dynamic 
weather models that solve the physical equations of the atmosphere. And these models are updated, you know, every uh, four times a day. Some some local models are updated every hour. And these are very high resolution, skillful models, uh, can go out uh, to 16 days. And uh, th these are have gotten very accurate uh, over the last several years. We're as accurate now most areas at the three to five day outlook as we used to be at the one day outlook. So our, our tactical, you know, what's gonna happen today, tomorrow, the next day outlook is, is pretty good. It's really getting very good. Uh, then, you know, beyond that, uh, when you go into weeks and months and seasons, like like the hurricane season, then then that's a different technique to, to forecast. We tend to go to a statistical-based type analysis that use all the ENSO type uh, indexes. Uh, what I always ask people, you know, everybody says we've got a <clears throat> El Nino or a La Nina, and this means this to the weather. And I go, what happens to the weather if we don't have an El Nino or La Nina? We still have weather. It just uh, so it, it's a combination of uh, dynamics and statistics, uh, looking at historical trends. And with seasonal, you don't get the, what we'd normally forecast uh, is typical. You know, it's going to, temperatures above average, precepts above average, but you don't get the extremes, like the winds are going to reach up to 100 mile an hour with the hurricane, you know, in, in August. We, we just, that isn't part of the seasonal weather models. So we, we kind of get, uh, go from the extreme day to day to kind of uh, departure type information for mainly for precip and temperature. And, and then a whole nother um, modeling effort that we have is a global climate. And, and that's, you know, we get these long term simulations. I saw an article uh, just a day or two ago that said, uh, the uh, climate change cause is going to cause 40% more heat wave death, or has caused 40% more heat wave deaths over the last several years. Um, first thing I would ask is, what is a heat wave? Because we haven't really defined a heat wave, except everybody's got a notional idea. But these these global climate models, there's hundreds of them. Uh, they're controlled by the uh, IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, under the UN. And these climate models are coarser resolution. Uh, they try to simulate the air, land, and ocean interaction uh, when you add in, you know, temperature change, uh, greenhouse gas changes, and it really tries to simulate what does that mean in the long term. Those models um, are highly uh, rigorous uh, for what they used to be, so we're getting much better. Are they perfect? No. Uh, but what will you do with the models is then you take the simulation data and then you look at it on a regional scale within GIS to look at local impacts. So how we look at weather in time scale really makes a difference in what model we do use. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for that. I have another audience uh, question that, David, I wonder if I can come to you on. This is from Thadine Gibson. And, and the question is, are there any practices of the respective built environment types, residential, commercial, et cetera, that are speeding up climate change activities globally that RICS professionals, businesses, leaders, governments should be paying keen attention to with a view to mitigate. Would you speak to that, David? Sure, yeah, and it's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, keenly from that, um, you know, we talk about the word mitigation and I love that word because it, it is in my company name. Um, but, you know, mitigation 
is is really a global challenge. Um, you know, when you look at uh, you know the sort of cement production, for instance, forty percent of CO two comes from fossil fuels. You know, we're in the built environment. You know, we can uh, reduce the carbon footprint as built environment professionals by advising our clients to to build greener, um, decrease you know decrease decrease the greenhouse gases by building greener buildings. Um, you know, reducing the carbon footprint. Um, so certainly, from our professional standards, the RSS is doing a lot. There are policy documents uh, in the RSS website that you can go to, which talks about um, the training of um, of our members and, and how what they're doing in in order to um, help reduce um, the, the the carbon footprint within buildings, uh, within construction materials is is uh, is keen to reduce the carbon footprint as well. So um, I, I think you know without labouring too much into the, the, the question. Um, I think that probably answers most of what you you, you want to know, uh, I'm assuming. Yeah, you know, great. Thanks, David. And I, I have another audience question, which really complements the question I um, planned just now. So let me read that out uh, before I come to you, Crystal and David. And, and this is from Stephen Poon. And he asks, how would climate change impacts affect city functions? which is complementary to this question, what steps are cities and policymakers taking to understand and mitigate the effects of rising sea levels and extreme weather? How well are they doing? And maybe uh, we'll start with you, Crystal, if you could speak to those questions. Yeah, sure. Um, and this varies so much city by city, and um, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on all the, the policies in place. I can speak from the weather side as much as possible and from experience, but you know, I've read a lot about mitigation and adaptation. And there's a lot happening, you know, within the city to reduce emissions, as David was talking about, stabilizing levels of these heat trapping greenhouse gases in, in various ways, and then adapting to the climate we're currently in. I mean, that is key because what's normal now was not normal 100 years ago. I know here in San Diego, uh, there has been millions of dollars of funding already by the city to help mitigate some of the risk along our coastline and the bluffs are eroding and Amtrak service has been shut down at times. So we're already experiencing the effects and doing what we can to, uh, to stay abreast with the changing situation, but it's impacting our travel here, unfortunately. Um, several people actually lost their lives last year because they were under a bluff on the beach when it collapsed. So we're noticing changes with our, our natural environment as we speak. I know in places like Denmark, it's one of the top countries uh, doing the most to help protect the environment. And they're, they're setting a lot of goals to, re, you know, to impact their energy consumption and renewables in the coming years. Um, being less dependent on fossil fuels, for example. But it's really city by city. Uh, the more I do some research, you know, places in, in China, for example, are introducing this concept of sponge cities. And they're creating these open spaces to soak up more flood water. Then you've got the greening of rooftops to combat urban heat islands. And the more we learn about what's happening and where cities are being innovative, the more we collaborate together, I think the more successful we will be. I don't know if that helps to answer that question or if anyone would love to chime in, that would be great. David? Yeah, I think, I think yeah, stemming, stemming from that crystal, and, and obviously it's a, it's a great question. I think that, um, you know, cities um, and the policymakers, I think they're doing enough, uh, or they're certainly on the right track. They're involving the business leaders. Um, you know, and again, living in Miami for seven years, um, they they have appointed a climate resilient officer, um, and they have a, actually a lot of power um, to to make change. Um, they work alongside um, the mayor uh, of the city, and you know some of the the points they're doing in 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 Miami is to you know deal with the um, the raising of the roads, for instance, um, on the lower levels. Um, they're, they're putting uh, roads at a higher level and 
the runoff from those roads uh, are going into the drainage system and they're putting additional pumps um, to, to pump that water away um, from the buildings. Um, is that going to you know, deal with the future of potential sea level rise? I think it will to a certain point, uh, but also um, it, uh, you know, water has a, a way of finding its own level. So, there, you know, no action is not an option, um, as people um, say in the industry. Um, and certainly there are action points being taken by uh, a lot of the, the cities and the policymakers are, 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 from what I can see, certainly putting together you know, action plans um, and hopefully um, risk registers that will identify those key areas of their local sustainability to, to reduce um, you know, some of these, uh, these, these points that we're, we're talking about. Thanks, David. Maybe we can stay with you um, in talking about resilience. How, how resilient is our infrastructure to climate-related stress? Um, I, I think I think it's pretty resilient. Um, however, when you when you look at buildings, um, and I mentioned under construction, um, people forget how uh, we've got to look at temporary works. For instance, you know, I, I deal with a lot of you know ex excavation of basements, you know, three or four stories deep. When when you think of a, of a basement near a coastal location, or you know, even in a in a city where it's um, there, there is no real risk from surge, heavy rainfalls will flood that basement, and pumps just aren't enough. Potentially, you know, side walls can collapse, and we've seen them from insurance claims that I see. Um, these things happen, and and they cost millions of dollars. Um, but having said that, you know, the the actual completed infrastructure is is quite resilient, but we are seeing a lot more. Um, as mentioned uh, by Crystal earlier about wildfires. But when I start looking at the buildings that are built in those wildfire districts, they're timber frame. Um, to me, it makes no sense. You know, that's not a resilient building that sits in um, a location of wildfires. The US tends to use a lot of timber to, to build homes. Um, and, you know, wildfire regions aren't the best but by putting timber, timber homes in, in, in there. I also look at some of the infrastructure. Um, you know, a lot of the um, electrical um, power cables are strung above ground. Um, you know, it, it, I, I'm living in Atlanta now, and we have, you know, the odd freeze uh, which occurs, and they can't cope. The, the infrastructure completely fails. Um, the wires break, uh, and then you've got 100,000 homes with no power. Um, and it only takes a very, very small tropical storm to to cause damage to some of these power lines that are uh, are strung above ground. So resilience in that sense, I, I can't see that. Um, and um, you know, I think certainly that there can be some changes made. And on that point, David, how do we deal with it? How does it become refreshed or retrofitted? And you know, the, any comments on where funding might come from? Um, it's, I mean, the, the retrofitting. I think, you know, again, I always turn to um, doing an assessment of, you know, from a local standpoint, risk assessments, which will help identify those vulnerable areas, which are, um, you know going to you know benefit most and you know where where the money comes from um particularly with buildings you know there are governments uh, who are looking at um you know carbon um you know rebates uh, for instance in retrofitting buildings to reduce carbon um there's there's tax incentives which can help that there's grants out there which you can tap into uh, and it depends which country you live in um but there's certainly grants out there from you know, I know the European funds are available for um, dealing with um, you know uh, climate um, resilient type buildings, um, and so there's grants that can be had that can be drawn down from that. Um, but you know, it, it's it's always going to be a very difficult challenge. There has to be this joining of the dots between policymakers, businesses, and the risk 
that's involved in um, piecing the, the jigsaw puzzle together. Um, and in the same way that we look at planning of a local community, we look at it in detail, but forget about the aspects of, you know, what else is going to affect that. We have to look at climate change as being, you know, on the forefront of you know, any decisions that are made. Thanks, David. We have another audience question. Uh, and to everybody in the audience, please do send in your questions. Uh, it's much appreciated. I think it adds a lot to the webinar. So gold star to Stephen Poon for another great question here. And I'll be honest to my panelists, I'm not quite sure who <laughs> would be best place to speak to this. And maybe, I'll, Rob, I'll give you the first crack. Um, how will climate change, and it, it, the way it's worded is and other trends, so I think combined with other trends, such as urbanization and demographic change, create, enhance, or reduce vulnerability. So, Rob, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, a good question, very good question. The, you know, the climate change is more than just saying it's going to warm up one and a half degrees. Uh, the, the, the weather is also getting a lot more extreme. So when you look at vulnerability, uh, you know, economically, you have to look at not just infrastructure, but you have to look at agriculture, hydrology uh, for power. Uh, you have to look at the whole picture because the atmosphere, as Crystal said earlier, is getting more extreme. I mean, we're seeing weather events uh, over the last couple of years that we've, we've never seen before. Just not not even a 99.99 percent probability. It's just uh, really off the scale. So you have the the, the climate change is going to cause you know crops to fail. You may have to plant different crops. Uh, one example about crops is uh, you know every, everything in in the spring is warmer. Uh, temperatures average quite a bit warmer. You know. February, March, April, and the growing degree days cause fruit blooms to bloom early. Well, that doesn't mean that the cold air is not around. It's just on average we've been warmer. So like for an apple crop or a peach crop, the the blooms come early. I think Japan just set a record this year for the earliest cherry blooms ever. But then, you know, you're vulnerable to cold air. So you could you you could lose your whole apple crop for an entire region uh, overnight so that that really makes the vulnerability really uh, increase thanks rob any other yeah. comments from other panelists about climate change mixed with other trends like urbanization or demographic change well i just this is crystal here i wanted to point out the health impacts as well because we're doing a lot of research on on air quality and you know the impact of wildfire smoke, for example, the increase in pollen and the extension of our pollen season and how that's impacting those with respiratory conditions. So there, there's a big health element involved also. When we see an increase in hurricane, you know, tropical activity in general around the globe, you have more concerns with flood damage and mold, and that's also going to create a, a health impact. So I just wanted to comment on that. And and I think, Ken, not to take over for you, but we can transition into the next question too and talking about how to predict these extreme events and you know where we can uh, make cities more, more livable. I, we have a great case study to talk about out of Texas. For Please. Example. Yeah. Thanks, Crystal. I mean, I'd like, before we get into that, you know, as we speak right now, um, the extremes are, are pretty, Pretty amazing. Um, Manaus uh, on the Amazon River uh, today set an all-time record high flow uh, elevation. So there's flooding across Manaus. And at the same time uh, in southern Brazil, uh, they've got a power shortage because they're in a drought. And so the weather the weather is not just warming, it's becoming a lot more extreme. And it's just, you don't have to look very hard to see it. Yeah. 
And let's let's talk about Texas then. Talk about extremes here. This was in February of this year, and I believe we have a slide here, our, our case study to dive a bit deeper into what happened. But as a meteorologist, you know these are the the events where people really began to question the change in our climate. Um, you know we don't use global warming as much in in our consulting business. We talk about our changing climate. Because yes, there is that degree of warming happening around the globe, but it's contributing to these counterintuitive events uh, such as the Texas freeze. And I want Rob to chime in and, and talk a little bit more about the polar vortex and, and how this all ties together. Okay. I mean, Texas is uh, basically an amazing event. It, it, it's never happened before, uh, so it will happen again. The, what happened there is, you know, a lot of folks said, well, <laughs> we got climate change, global warming, and look what happened in Texas. Tell me about climate change. Well, I can tell you about climate change. The reason that Texas got so cold, and it was record cold for a record length, is that the polar vortex of, of cold air across the North Pole, which is usually a very stable consistent uh, area of cold air uh, basically split in half and and what happened when it split is it didn't take but a few days to get down to texas so texas got extremely cold because the cold air and across the poles uh, was not across the poles and it split and spread southward into texas it also got very cold across eastern europe at the same time uh, oh, by the way, there was record highs uh, in between those uh, splits. So what happened in Texas is they don't have the infrastructure. They they basically put their water pipes in their attics above above the heated space. So when it got cold and stayed cold in Texas, their pipes immediately froze, and and it's because of their their construction methods. Uh, same thing is going to happen to Florida, where cold air is going to arrive. It's going to stay for too long, and it's going to freeze the pipes because the pipes in many areas of, of Florida are also in the attic above the heated space. So Texas was a direct result of of the polar vortex splitting, which was a direct result of of the warming. Uh, atmosphere and weakening the jet stream that, that allowed the polar vortex to, to split. Thank yeah, you for that. A Go great, ahead, Crystal. No, I was just thinking about, you know, everything David has explained with adapting to a new infrastructure and, and how do we deal with this as we adjust to new climate norms. You know, I think the, we know the drainage systems are, are stressed because uh, of our built environment and the, the concrete that we've added, but also um, our power system is stressed. Well, on that point, we have another great audience question from Stephen Matz, and, and he says, very appropriate to what you're saying, how much funding are governments allocating to climate risk prevention measures? Would anybody like to speak to that? Um, I'm not sure about the amounts um, around the world, and they and they vary. Um, I know that Europe have um, allocated around $100 million um, to the climate funding package, um, which uh, how that's been distributed, I, I'm I'm not sure. But but certainly, um, you know, there is funding out there that's available, um, and it's uh, advisable to to check within your region as to. Um, how to tap into that funding, um, and and also you know banks um, uh, are, are favourable to to um, lending money on green buildings. Um, there's incentives there um, for development in that aspect as well. Um, and going back to the insurance aspect, um, I talked about you know insurers looking at this in more detail and how are they going to underwrite the risk when it comes to um, you know. Uh, projects of this nature, um, and uh, you know they favour 
uh, green buildings. And, and there's the, these are the incentives that are on offer from different insurers to reduce premiums. So there, there's money saving aspects there. So there's, there's certain ways of getting funding through reductions in premiums and so on and so forth. So I think as a combination that, that certainly goes towards helping with uh, the funding of this, this side of uh, construction. Great, thanks, David. Um, in in r relation to that, and maybe I'll turn to you, Rob. We we have another question from Stephen, and he's asking about technology. Um, and this kind of relates to a point that you made, Rob. But is technology helping to mitigate climate impact? Are we seeing more research and development in this area? No, there's a lot more effort in the in the modeling. Of of how how the climate's going to change and what's the probability of of this or that type of a change. So on the from the atmosphere point of view, there's a lot. I know there's a lot of a lot more um, effort now in funding about trying to predict floods, uh, not just a day or two ahead of time, but maybe weeks to months ahead of time. Uh, a whole a whole lot of effort about floods. Uh, so, you know, from from the modeling point of view, uh, as far as atmospheric, we do, there's a lot more money going into it uh, from the U.S. side, for sure. And hopefully that that starts to improve our longer range, the seasonal type outlooks coming up. As far as the infrastructure, um, I'm not. I know that that's increasing. And I know, you know, like insurance companies are saying, if you put on this type of roof, uh, which is a little bit more costly, you want to you want to save on insurance over the next, you know, several years. So there's a, there's a lot of that type of cost that for infrastructure, and a lot of you know, green energy for cars. Uh, I happen to have 145 solar panels at my house. Uh, so I'm liking that because one, I'm saving energy and two, I'm not polluting the atmosphere as much. I'll let others chime in if they want. Well, thanks, Rob. And, and maybe I'll add to the question a little bit. We, we have a, a great question from Stephen, again, in the audience. And, and he asks, where are the opportunities within infrastructure, institutions, knowledge sharing, to create more resilient systems for today and the future. And maybe I'll just add to Stephen's questions, sort of where are the, like the comments you just made, Rob, about technology, where, where are the needs for more um, knowledge sharing and maybe research and development, just adding to Stephen's question. I wonder, um, would anybody like to speak to that? One of the, I'll just make a quick comment. One of the Please. fundamental problems is Anytime you start dealing with weather and climate, uh, there's there's uncertainty. Uh, we we can't predict exactly. Uh, we can do studies and come up with probabilities, but we can't. It's not engineering data. We don't know that the temperature at, at point at this point is going to be 1.85 degrees higher in 10 years or 20 years. We we can kind of give you a range and kind of give you a probability estimate, but it's not it's not engineering data, so it's hard to convey uncertainty with with all the uh, modeling and the analysis, and it, that's that's something we always try to struggle with because weather guys, weather people, tend to yeah, they we're happy with one. You know, time frame of one resolution, and people want to know what does that mean. You know, give us further out, give us higher resolution. So that's a constant uh, improvement that we try to do. Thanks, Rob. And any more comments about technology before we move on? Um, just, just a, a small point. I mean. Um, it's great to see um, technology being used 
for predictive modeling and, and data analysis. Um, but also on, on a smaller scale, it can be used. Um, I know companies out there that are using Internet of Things within commercial property to um, you know, determine the carbon footprint of a building, for instance. Um, you know, this, this helps us with more accurate measurements um, of the carbon footprint of the building. Um, it also um, guides um, people in the right direction when it comes to putting together their risk register on, on a strategy um, in working with, with, the, uh, with the policy makers. Um, so, you know, certainly there's going to be um, emerging technology that will come from all of this. Somebody, you know, can, can you know, surely um, benefit from emerging technology and, and therefore there's, there's, there's companies out there that are doing that now. And I think that will only um, improve. Um, there's going to be more companies in the same way that we, we, we just went through or we're still going through a COVID crisis technology there was a burst of technology that came from that um, and I think that um, this is what's happening today um, when it comes to climate change um, you know there, there's companies out there spending money on, on that type of resource so uh, watch this space and, and uh, see how all that data will collect and merge together uh, and tie into things like predictive modeling for weather. Thanks David. Let's stay with you for uh, the final theme of this webinar about the role of professionals. And the, the question, David, is what role do you see for built environment professionals in advising businesses, policymakers, and cities how best to mitigate climate risk? Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. And, um, and I think that this kind of stems on, on the back of what I was just talking about, that the opportunities for those in the built environment uh, uh, profession um, to to really tap into um, research that's out there. There's there's so much research out there that you can um, you can tap into and um, advise your your clients um, and and business profession uh, business um, professionals out there that um, uh, are looking to to buy property um, or you know commercial real estate investments, you know, how should we be advising them? We, we've got to know a bit about climate change in order to advise them properly. Um, you know, should we be saying to them, um, you know, if you're going to invest a hundred million dollars in building this shopping center here, uh, please be advised that the climate might change in 30 years. Um, you know, shopping centers are for longevity. Um, and could there be mass migration of that location where there's going to be no foot traffic anymore if there's a you know a heat island produced um, these are the things that we i think as building professionals we have to look at more um, and, and and advising our clients and, and the role is out there to tap into this information um, and working with insurance companies is key to all of this um, as well because a lot of this risk can be insured. Um, insurance companies are looking at, um, you know, the climate gap uh, in, in insuring, you know, certain projects, uh, certain uh, aspects where the, the built environment could be affected by climate change. So I think there's definitely a role. Um, there's lots of research papers out there from the RICS which can uh, provide you um, with um, a lot of this information as well. Um, and there's certainly resources, training, and competence uh, from the RICS uh, as a global profession that um, can give you that as well. Thanks, David. And, and, and maybe just a final thought, if I could put a little topspin on that question. Do you have a view of maybe what the responsibility should be? There's the opportunity and the need, but when it comes to professionals, I'm thinking of, for example, issues of ethics, where, um, to use an extreme example, if you have a client that wants to do something unethical, you have a professional responsibility to um, say no. And yet, the, you know, we're not at that same model when it comes to you know, issues related to climate change or sustainability, right? I, so. 
do, do you see that changing or, or maybe do you have any thoughts on the responsibility of professionals in this area? And, and I, I do, and, and this isn't necessarily the view of the RSCS. It's my own personal view. Um, I think that, um, you know, from from a personal standpoint that we are all ethical in order to, you know, provide our clients with the right information and to be ethical when, when we're doing so. And, and, and obviously the RSCS promote um, ethical responses to to anything that uh, that we do, we all go through that challenge of um, uh, providing that to our clients. Clients do want certain things that we should say no to, um, and as professionals, we we do that. However, there are, and, and I'll use a, a brief analogy. Um, there there are uh, companies out there that I know that have been sued, not so much from climate change, but from the point of that small acorn tree um, that was rooted in the front garden of a house and as it grew um, larger and larger and larger when the original inspection was done that tree wasn't picked up on the uh, on the report but in 20 years time that tree got so big it caused damage to the house now do we use that analogy and say to ourselves are we supposed to um, provide an ethical response to our clients to say you know in 20 years time there could be a potential problem here that could affect your um, your property um, you know by sea level rise and therefore wipe out the 30 million dollars you've just spent um, on, on developing this land um, I think these are the 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 answers we should look at um, you know and policymakers have to be part of that response, insurers, um, funders, you know, and uh, planning uh, as well um, to stop these things from happening, um, because we all play a vital responsibility into the built environment. Thank you. Uh, w what a great thought, David, a great analogy. Thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists, Crystal, Rob, David, thank you very much on behalf of the, the whole audience. And a reminder to you all that we will publish a recording and written summary of this webinar, as well as the presentation online. Please feel free to share them with your professional networks and take a few moments to let us know when you, what you thought of today's session. We'd love to hear from you by completing the online poll, which will appear on your screens at the end of this webinar. The World Built Environment Forum Global Summit will be visiting Dubai as part of Expo 2020 Dubai in January of 2022. The program will focus on the livable city, agile, healthy, and resilient. You can book your ticket today at the super early bird rate. Please visit the website rics.org slash webf, W-B-E-F, to book and for further details on the program. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, where you can receive news of upcoming webinar webinars and catch up on anything you have missed. Finally, download the WBEF app from the Google App Store or, or, or uh, uh, the Apple App Store, where you can access the latest innovative global thought leadership content across the built environment. And until next time, goodbye, and thank you all very much.